Clap your hands to the Lord Jesus. He is in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, let out a shout of praise. Worthy is the name. Hallelujah. That's right. Clap your hands to the Lord. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Well, do me a favor. Find a few people you don't know and introduce yourself to them real quick. Go ahead. Excellent. Very proud of my class. I see you. I see what you're doing here. Very good. We talked about connecting with people in our second session. They learned some things. Fantastic. You have your Bible or your phone? Why don't you grab that real quick? And while you're doing that, I just want to say how much I appreciate the invitation to preach at Torch Conference. What an amazing thing is happening here. The growth of this conference, the hunger that is here, and of course, we give honor to Brother Grant, and we give honor to Brother Andrew Reese and Brother Seth Gillett and the instructors at ABI, all of their staff. And did you know that there are some ABI alumnus who have helped to uh, underwrite some of the expenses of this? Can we give everybody a hand who's contributed? We're so very thankful for that. I'm grateful for Apostolic Bible Institute. There are iconic preachers among us who come from this school and all kinds of people, faithful men of God, are preaching the gospel all across the country and many multitudes and thousands of people in pews because of the investment that was made here in lives. So I'm very grateful to Apostolic Bible Institute. Also, Sister Heather Reese, the rest of the story is, is that she's the one who created the graphic. Sister Heather Reese created the graphics. And Brother Andrew Reese said, who made these graphics? And I said, Heather Poland, I have to marry that woman. I don't, I, I just have to marry her. So that's how it went. Isn't that how it went, Brother Andrew? Well, maybe not quite like that. Amen. Well, I'm doing something that feels a little awkward to me. Uh, I'm jumping the rails of where I was going to go last night. I had a, the message all ready to go, shiny and brand new, and, and Sister Heather Reese made a, made a title slide for me. And as this morning, as I was interacting with students, I felt God just pushing something into my spirit, and I, I can't do anything less than what he's telling me to do. God gave me a message for young people many years ago. In fact, in November of 2001, I preached that message in this state. And I felt God just push this back into my heart and say, I want you to preach it to this generation. There's a word that God wants you to receive. It's a timeless word. Psalm chapter 91 and verse 13 is our text. To all of the staff and all of the uh, leaders who brought students here god bless you thank you for making that investment to our young people who took time off of work you did the right thing for those of you who walked away from that you know math class for a couple of days you did the right thing you're in the right place psalm chapter 91 and verse 13 thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. I want to preach to you on the subject of young lions. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. Your presence is here. The anointing is here. Lord, I believe that you're going to deliver and set free today. In Jesus' name, we take authority over bondage. 
We take authority over the chains that bind and hold these young men and women back. We take authority over every spirit that would wage war on the preach word of God. Let there be a yes in our spirit and an amen. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Turn to three or four people and let them know. Tell them, say, you are absolutely better looking than I am. You may be seated. Do you know why I did that? Because whenever I preach, I'm more motivated when I know that there are sinners in the house, and some of you just lied. So that helps me a lot. Thank you so much. Lions. Lions are fierce creatures. Every part of their anatomy reminds us that they were engineered to be predators. Lions have keen eyesight for hunting, explosive speed for the chase, tremendous strength to bring down animals three times their size and weight. Lions are agile creatures, and they're agile so that they can avoid the prey's efforts to defend themselves. They have claws for grasping. They have powerful jaws for suffocating the prey. They have dagger-like teeth for tearing. You have to understand today that there is no such thing as a domesticated lion. No such thing. You can take a lion out of the wild, but you will never take the wild out of the lion. Given the opportunity, a lion will destroy you because destruction is the nature of the lion. King David, the writer of our text, had a history with lions. While standing in the field, David saw a lion attacking one of his sheep. And although David was just a boy, not even old enough to enlist in the army, the Bible says that he smote the lion. Now, when I get to heaven, I hope that there's a media section. And I hope that there's a way that I can see this, how it really happened. I want to see it. A boy. Walking up to a lion that's distracted because it has its prey. And that boy does a Superman punch on a lion. Pow! And punches that lion. But the Bible says that that lion, after it had been smitten, King James, by this boy, rose up against him. Now I want you to think about that. So he had the courage to punch a lion in the face. Boom! And that lion just kind of goes. And now the lion is looking at this boy. And the scripture says, the boy grabbed him by his beard, by his mane, and killed him. Wow. What a moment. Now, in our text we find the psalmist David's command to tread or trample or put under your feet the young lion. And it's a very curious thing because when we read this scripture, and I want media to bring this back up if you would, you will find out, you will discover that David has already mentioned the lion. Thou shalt tread upon the lion. He mentions the lion. But later on in the same verse, he mentions the young lion as something that should be trampled under our feet. And so I realize that there is purpose and there is truth in these words. I think that David was, had, was speaking from an experience. I, I don't think that he was being redundant. I don't think that he sort of lost his place of thought when he was writing. I'm only speculating now, but if you would just go with me for a moment. I suspect that if we were to hit the rewind button in David's life, a few years prior to this confrontation with this lion, if we could go back to that story where he struggled with a lion and hit the rewind button, we might discover that David had come upon that same lion when it was just a cub. 
Is it possible that David came upon that same lion when it was just to come? And maybe he knew what should be done for the sake of the flock. He had to kill that lion. But compassion and sympathy replaced common sense. Is it possible that David permitted a young lion to live and over the course of time that lion matured and became a threat to his livelihood, to his very life, to his family? Think about this with me for a moment because there is a great truth concealed in David's warning to tread upon the young lion. And here's the truth. Note takers, write this down, would you? Here's the truth. There are some things that are best conquered in our lives sooner than later. If you spare the young lion, you will face him someday in all of his power. And what I'm doing is I'm preaching for your tomorrows. I'm preaching for your ministry. And I just had a, a conviction in my spirit. There are people within the sound of my voice. There is no doubt that you have a calling on your life. And that you have been called according to his purpose. There is no doubt that your heart is sincere. And that you are at torch conference to hear what thus saith the Lord. You want to be a part of this end time revival. But there are small seeds of compromise that are in your life and I've come to tell you it's time to confront the young lions in your life that would put a risk to your ministry tomorrow all across this great country on a Sunday morning there are men and women maybe 10 years 20 years older than you who like you had callings they had dreams and visions they were made for more. They had a holy discontent in their spirit. I just can't go sell cars. I, I'm not going to be content to just have to just put money away in a 401k plan for retirement. No, I've been made for more. I want to serve God. I want to live his purpose. They, they had the dreams and they had visions. But today, they are not achieving their dreams. On Sundays, they sit in pews and their dreams remain unfulfilled. Why? Because they're too busy trying to deal with full-grown lions in their lives that they didn't deal with a long time ago. They sit in pews and they love God, but they have addiction problems to pornography. They sit in pews and they were made for more, but they never confronted that spirit of pride in their life. They never confronted that anger in their life. They never confronted that spirit of independence in their life. They never really confronted their lack of prayer in their life. They never confronted the apathy in their life, and it went unchecked. They were made for more, but they allowed a young lion to grow up, and it sabotaged their future. They don't have the time to serve, and they will never realize their dream because they're too busy just trying to survive. Now the idea is, I just want to be saved. What is it in your life that could place risk in your tomorrows, young man? Ladies, what is it in your life that God has been talking to you about that seems to persist, that attitude, that relationship that's out of bounds, that could cause you to be one who would live your life with your dreams unfulfilled. When you harbor a young lion in your life and you don't deal that issue you have with your personal cell phone, in your hand, in your pocket is a weapon of mass distraction. In your purse, in your pocket is the reason we convinced ourselves we don't have the time to pray. And we're updated on everybody else's status but his. And we've got all the ESPN scores down, but we still can't have a conversation about the Ten Commandments. 
a weapon of mass distraction. One more video, one more fail. I've got to watch one, and all of this mindless and meaningless stuff is being pushed into your brain and through your brain, and we're trying to see what's going to happen. If we don't figure out how to deal with this technology, you're going to be at the train station when your ship comes in. You didn't have the time to pray. You didn't have the time to devote yourself to the study of the Word of God, and you gave yourself over to this distraction, and you're going to find somebody else answering that call. Somebody else is going to be standing in that pulpit. Somebody else is going to be answering the call to that country. No, I've made up my mind. I'm going to trample this young lying under my feet I'm gonna reclaim territories of my life devil you can't have my calling devil you can't have my destiny I'm gonna take care of this thing in my life yes come on somebody needs to get real somebody needs to say preacher I need help pastor I need some help I need you to talk to me I've allowed something in my life and I don't know how to put it away. I keep going to these places on the internet that I shouldn't go to. But I've got a calling. I've got a destiny. And I've got to trample this thing under my feet. Yes, Jesus. You may be seated. For every young lion. For every evil thought. For every evil practice that you eradicate in your life. You are sparing yourself a future battle with a full-grown lion. So what is the problem? Why is it so difficult to deal with sin at the infancy stage? The same reason that it would be difficult to put a predator to death at the infancy stage. Because lions are so cute as cubs. Just three or four pounds at birth. Eyes shut. Cute spots. Defenseless creatures. And it's at this stage that the innocent child says at the zoo, Mama, I want one. Can I have one, Mama? It's so cute. It's so cute. And that child cannot process the fact that that beautiful little creature is lying right next to a 600-pound predator. And what the predator is, that cub will become. So we, we miss the point. This is where we miss it. This is where we mismanage our lives. At this stage, the innocent stage. The steep slope to sin that destroys preachers. The steep slope to sin that sabotages future of young people. Always starts out innocent. And you're nurturing an Instagram relationship. And your pastor doesn't know about it. And your parents don't know about it. And you're nurturing a relationship that's out of bounds. And it's innocent. It's innocent. It's just a hobby. It's just a hobby. What I'm doing is not sinful. Preacher? What I'm doing is not sinful. It's, it's not a hobby. It's your obsession. You can't put the buttons down. And hours pass by playing that recreational game, that online game, at the expense of that preparation time and that connection time with God can I just tell you look we can have lots of passions and I'm not here to preach against everything we can have many passions but you can only have one obsession and for some of us church is a passion but video games are our obsession man what are you talking about we're talking to 20-year-olds here, Brother Soto. They're 28-year-olds living in their parents' basements, and they can't put the game away. And it's hijacked their whole life. You're not immune to the distractions of this world. 
Brother Soto, you don't understand. There's so many things that are worse than what I'm doing. It's, I'm okay. I haven't stepped out of bounds. It's, it's not necessarily what you're doing. It's what you're about to do if you don't trample this young lion under your feet. I had a conversation with a lady one time. And I was trying to help her to understand, impress in her mind, that the relationship that she was involved in was not good for her. And so it was kind of a no-brainer. Turn to your neighbor and say, no-brainer. It was a no-brainer. Now, this lady, she, she was a single lady. She had a son, and, and she had a good job, and, and she lived in a nice place, drove a nice car, and everything's good. But she, she has this young cub, this lion cub. And she's playing a game. But the relationship is at the innocent stage. But I see a predator. And it's a no-brainer. And I'm telling her. I said, well, number one, understand this. This, this individual, this, this guy has several children. And he's never been married. And each of his children have different moms. And he's not employed. And he has some addiction problems. Was I overreacting? Do you feel like I was overreacting? Should I just have supported her? And the list just went on and on and on, and it was obvious, this is no good. Do you know what her response to me was? I'll be careful. I'll be careful. This is essentially what she was doing. She was cradling a lion cub, and she was just saying, it's all right. Look at this. We're just friends. We're just friends. I, everything's going to be fine. I wouldn't do anything to put my child at risk. I wouldn't do anything to put my life at risk. I'll just be careful. Everything's going to be fine. You hit the fast but forward button, and I kid you not, within months, she had lost her job. Her car was gone. She had lost it all. And she called me only because she and her son had not eaten for two days. The Bible tells us that the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Not what? Whom? And the Bible clearly indicates that our adversary, the devil, is a predator with predator's instinct. And he is cunning and he has been known to ambush people. He kills for the sport. sport. He kills for the bloody conquest. He loves to tear lives apart. He enjoys tearing marriages apart. He loves to destroy churches. He loves to take a college-age student and just decimate their life before they can say yes to their God purpose. It's in his nature. It's his desire. That's what he is all about. And I believe this is what Paul had in mind when he wrote in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Give no place to the devil. How many people have been destroyed because they spared the young lion? I'm reminded of Saul who spared the Amalekite king when he was told to spare no one among the Amalekites. He spared the king and King Saul unwittingly left the back door of his life unbolted. And the sad narrative as you hit the fast forward button to his life brings us to a wounded Saul. And as he took his final breath on the battlefield, he asked his destroyer who he is. And the destroyer said to him, I am an Amalekite. The very thing that Saul allowed to live became his destroyer in his moment of weakness. And you can't convince yourself that you're going to be okay when you're dealing with a predator. You cannot convince yourself, oh, I'm not going to allow this relationship to endanger me. I'm not going to allow this thing to get out of control. I'm not hurting anybody. It may not be the right thing, but I'm not hurting anybody. See, it just, it's just something that I do every once in a while when no one's around. 
But why don't you trample it? Why don't you confront it? Why don't you confess it? Why don't you ask someone to help you? Why don't you ask someone to pray with you? Why don't you ask somebody to join together with you? And why don't you begin to study the Word of God and equip yourself to be more powerful and valiant and courageous and strategic in overcoming this thing? The reason why we're not doing it is because we are convinced that we have domesticated a predator. That we can have our calling and the compromise at the same time. Some of us don't want, don't want to let go of that internet relationship. Some of us don't want to stop watching that program. It's your favorite show. But it's got all kinds of stuff in it. All kinds of language. And somehow you're able to contextualize that. Because that's your favorite actor, or that's your favorite actress. And you're caught up in the storyline of this whole thing. And you're going to binge watch this thing. Because it's your favorite show. And you don't realize that slowly the enemy is gaining territory in your life. And there are words in that show that used to shock you and repulse you. And now it doesn't even move the needle of your heart. I'm here to preach to somebody. You think you've turned a lion into a pet. That's what your problem is. You're looking for alternatives because you don't want to kill this thing. You're emotionally attached. You are, generally inter you are genuinely interested in that person, in that situation. And you're delaying. The moment of radical submission when you would say, that's it, I'm not watching that show anymore. I'm never going to that website again. In fact, I'm going to make myself accountable. Maybe your pastor, maybe your youth pastor, maybe your parents have never heard of Covenant Eye, but I, you've heard of Covenant Eye. I'm going to put Covenant Eye on my phone, and I'm going to be accountable to someone about where I go and what I do with this cell phone because my calling is too precious, hell is too hot, and heaven is just too amazing for me to throw it all away for one more drink of poison. The enemy wants you to feel comfortable with young lions. The enemy wants you to feel comfortable with young lions. He wants you to believe that you of all people have struck a balance, an unprecedented balance in life. That somehow you can go home and with certain people or in privacy do certain things but you feel like you're okay because you can still feel God's presence or even God's anointing in church. I'm going to tell you something and I don't ever want you to forget what I'm about to say. Just because you feel God's presence does not mean you have his approval. God dwells in praise. And when we begin to praise God and we begin to celebrate his presence, when we begin to worship him, I'm telling you, you will feel his presence. And yes, you'll have some goosebumps. And yes, you might even speak in tongues. But I want you to know just because you feel that does not mean that you are in right position with God. And the enemy wants you to believe that you're okay. He's happy for you. He's content that you feel God's presence. And yes, that even you are anointed in a church, the context of church, while you're sitting in the privacy of your own home. He is not going to rear his ugly head in church. He wants you to believe that you have victory because of what you experience in church. He's on his best behavior. But you can't control this thing. That lion is growing. That lion is growing. Did anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I in the right place? Am I in the right place? How many of you know the devil wants to sabotage your future? And it's time for us to say, I'm not showing mercy to the devil. He's never shown mercy to me. But Jesus Christ on the cross, there's a picture of mercy. And I have courage today. I'm going to trample this thing under my feet. I'm going to admit it and quit it. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. 
to put this thing under my feet. I refuse to bring pornography addiction into my marriage. I refuse to bring pride into my ministry. I refuse to have a bad relationship with my pastor. I refuse to have a bad attitude towards leadership. I am going to be what God has called me to be. Somebody said amen. You may be seated. Because young people, you just have to know this. You cannot handle a lion. You can't. You just can't handle a lion. Okay? I'm the lion. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to try to illustrate to people how this works. All right? So I'm the lion, and I just want you to walk me around a little bit. And this is how it works. Now, we don't know each other very well. We did meet each other, and, and I was happy to meet you. And this illustration is not an indictment on your life personally, so I want you to know that I just pulled you out of the pew for an illustration, okay? You cool with that? All right. So take me for a walk. So you met her online. <laughs> you met her online. And actually, you had had, you'd known her previously a long time ago, and now you're reconnecting with her. And... And so, uh, she's not in church, but, you know, you, you're just friends. You just, you know, you like some of, the, like some of her pictures, and she likes some of your pictures. And, and uh, all of a sudden, she starts going through something. And, and so, you just kind of shout out to her and just say, hey, I'm sorry you're going through that. And the next thing, you get this, this message, and it says, can I have your phone number? And so you're like, ooh, I don't know if this is a good thing or not. So, so you, uh, you go ahead and you give her your phone number. You give her your phone number, and, and the next thing you know, you're talking, and she's sharing secrets with you, and, and, and she's telling you her story. And, you know, sometimes there's this sense of intimacy when we tell secrets, and we start disclosing our hearts and our dreams and to each other. And, and, and all of a sudden, you realize you have chemistry with her you realize that you have attraction with her. And, and she starts to talk a little bit about how she's interested in you. And, and you know, look, this isn't what I envisioned for my life. This isn't where I was going to go. This isn't what I was supposed to do. But, but this relationship is just kind of moving forward. Now, pastor doesn't know about it, and the youth pastor doesn't know about it, and your parents don't know about it. It's just kind of, it's just kind of happening, and then finally it happens. She says, hey, you know what? I'm going to come see you. I want to come see you. I'm going to drive all the way, and I'm going to come see you. And, and now this thing's bigger than you thought it was. You had this online relationship, but now she wants to see you, and, and she doesn't, she, she's not the person you want to introduce to your parents, but you really want to see her, and she says, well, where can we meet? And so now you're frantically trying to figure out where in the world could we meet where my parents can't see and my pastor can't see. I don't, I really want to see her because, boy, we're attracted to each other. Let me just stop and preach to somebody for a second and tell you there's a lot more to a relationship than chemistry and attraction. Just because you have chemistry and attraction doesn't mean you're right for each other. You've got to have a higher standard than chemistry and attraction. You've got to know their values. You've got to know their heart. You've got to know their commitment to God. Well, this one is a no-brainer. This one is a no-brainer. This one's a no-brainer. I mean, you know you shouldn't be here, but you're here. And you notice, you notice how all of us, he's not walking the lion anymore. The lion is walking him. And we don't know when it changed. You don't know the day. When you don't confront that thing that's in your life, that all of a sudden you realize you're not in control like you thought you were in control. And you were just losing your temper with your family and with your parents and you were talking back to them. And you never got control of your attitude when you were disappointed. But now it's a critical conversation with your pastor and in office. And all of a sudden you're spouting off to a spiritual leader in your life and the lion's taking you for a walk. And in it, the things that you thought you would never do. Saying things that you thought that you would never say. And this is exactly what that lion will do. The lion will isolate you. He will pull you away from your church he will pull you out from under the umbrella of the authority of your pastor he will drag you away from the counsel of the word of God and he will get you all by yourself 
And when he gets you all by yourself, you're not looking at your pet anymore. You're looking to the eyes of a cold-blooded killer. And now you got to fight for your life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, have you checked your attitude lately? You think that you're going to disrespect your parents, but when you get married, you're going to be respectful to your spouse? You really think that you're just going to reinvent yourself because you put a ring on your finger or you signed a marriage certificate somewhere? You think that you're going to reinvent yourself? You don't pray. You don't have a prayer life. And you get married and you're not going to have a prayer life when you get married. I'm here to tell somebody you need to trample that lion under your feet. Yes. Oh, you might win this fight we're about to have. You might win, but I promise you this, if you win this fight, you're still going to carry some scars for the rest of your life. There are saints within the sound of my voice. They love God. They have children. They're pursuing their calling, but they're also carrying scars disfiguring scars in their life that testify of a lion a battle and a lion who almost completed his work in their life you don't need to carry those scars for the rest of your life you don't just have to thank God well I survived that relationship or I survived that episode in your life I'm telling you, confront that lion at the infancy stage. Confront that lion at the cub stage. Don't show mercy to that lion because that lion is not going to show mercy to you. Who's in control? What is it about your life that you keep going back to that website? You think you're in control? You think you're in control? When you can't help but speak words about people, say words that you would never want them to hear, and there's gossip, a spirit of gossip in you, you think you've got control of that? My friend, God is bringing truth to your life right now, and he's pointing his finger at the thing that could destroy your future, and he's saying, let me have it. Let me have it. Surrender it to me. Let me arise and let me scatter the enemy in your life. Oh, I believe in God's grace. I believe that his grace is sufficient. But I also believe that if we permit a young lion to live, he will have his day in our life. And for this reason, it is important that we kill the evil thought at its introduction. It's important that we destroy resentment before it grows into bitterness. It's important that we kill that spirit of criticism and gossip before it becomes destructive. It's important that we deal with that spirit of jealousy before it becomes a murderous lion. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about young lions where somebody is promoted and you don't feel good about it. Somebody's holding the microphone and praise singing and they're doing it for the very first time and you don't feel good about that. And in your spirit you have a competitive spirit and an ambitious spirit and you can't celebrate someone else's wins you need to confront that spirit right now and say I refuse to create an opponent out of a brother or a sister I'm not gonna let this thing derail my life and my spirit yes that spirit of pride that spirit of ambition that unrighteous anger, that spirit of independence where you have a pastor but he's not, he's just a preacher to you, not your pastor. A spirit of independence where all of your best friends aren't saved. And the only people in your inner circle don't have the values that they should have. And you've already heard me say, some of you already, how can we reach the world if all of our friends are saved? I believe that we need to have relationships with people who don't know Jesus. But at the same time, we need to be careful about who we bring into the inner circle of our life. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's time to trample it under our feet. As the musicians come, I just want to tell you a story about a man by the name of Samson who encountered a lion. 
he slew that lion. And later, he passed by that place where he killed that lion. Many of you might know this story that he passes by the carcass after many days. After he, he fought the lion, he beat the lion, and he's walked away. And now he just happens to come by that spot. And the carcass of that lion is dried out. And the interior area of the rib cage of that lion, of that area, of that lion, is inhabited by bees. And that lion's carcass is full of honeycomb, sweet honey. And the Bible tells us that Samson took that honey and that sweet honeycomb and he took it back to his family and they tasted the sweetness of it. My point is this. If you will trample the lion, if you will fight this lion and defeat it, you will taste the sweetness someday. Your family will taste the sweetness someday. Your children will taste the sweetness someday. Hundreds of people will come to God and they will be able to celebrate with you the moment that you trampled that thing under your feet. Would you stand with me? There's going to be a pop quiz on your commitment to God. There's going to be a pop quiz on your commitment to God. The enemy knows if, if you are willing to sell God out, he'll pay the price. I've had moments in my life, key moments, where the enemy would send a powerful spirit to test me. Key moments. I could tell you lots of stories. But I just want you to know, I'm tasting the sweetness today, because I made up my mind, I'm going to trample that thing under my feet. It seems like I blinked, and, and here I am, 46 years old. Son who's married, daughter in college, son in high school. How different would my life be had I not decided to make a U-turn in my life when I was moving the wrong direction? Right in the middle of high school, my sophomore year, and I said, I don't even want to do this. I don't even want to be like this. What am I doing? I want to live for God. My problem is I don't know how to deal with peer pressure, but I'm tired of that. And I made a U-turn in front of God and everybody in my sophomore year. And I went to people and I said, I went to a public school and I said, you know what? I did things, I said things, and I'm sorry. I did those things and said those things. And I just want you to know that I've made up my mind that I'm going to live my life for Jesus Christ. So don't ever ask me to do that again. And I'm sorry you saw me do that in the first place. I'm sorry you witnessed that. And I just had to make a U-turn in front of everybody. And I'm sure that there were some people who doubted and criticized and were skeptical about my journey. But, but by the time I graduated from high school, I had the privilege to see many of my classmates baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. I saw it. Today I'm privileged to serve a great church. Today I have a beautiful wife who loves the Lord and I have three children. All of them invested in ministry and every one of them are serving God. They, they are wonderful young, uh, young people and I, I'm so very proud of them. What would my life be like had I not trampled that lion under my feet? What would my story be? Who would I be married to? What would my children look like? I'm, you're looking at somebody who's tasting the sweetness today. And so this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to ask, I'm asking you to step from where you are, and I'm asking you to come to the front as close as you can. And we're getting ready to pass our life through the furnace of truth. We're getting ready to pass our life through the furnace of truth. depression trying to hijack your life 
and there's a powerful spirit of depression on you? Is there a powerful spirit of materialism on you? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? Somebody hurts you and you've harbored that unforgiveness in your life. Maybe you have good reason to be upset with someone over what they did to you. Maybe somebody reached into your childhood and stole innocence away from you. You can't have that spirit of unforgiveness and preach about God's mercy. And so what we are going to do is we're going to point our finger at the thing that could bring risk to our tomorrows. And we're going to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. And I believe that the Lord is opening a window today to bring deliverance and liberation to this house. If you have a chronic addiction and nobody knows about it, you need to bring it out of the dark. And when you get home, you need to talk to your pastor. And your pastor is going to love you and he's going to show mercy to you. But if there's something in your life that you, you're not winning this battle alone, you've got to bring your pastor into the equation. And you talk to your pastor. You talk to your parents. Why? Because we're serious about this ministry thing. And while it may be difficult for a moment, I'm telling you it's not nearly as difficult when this lion grows up. In the name of Jesus, Father, we lift our hands to you. Lord, I am an open book and I can hide nothing from you. You know me, God. You know me, Lord. You know me, Jesus. You know where I hurt. You know where I'm struggling. You know, God, where I'm out of bounds. You know, Lord, that I have failed you in this area of my life. Young people, talk to the Lord a little bit right now. Maybe it's a sin of commission. Maybe it's a sin of omission, something you should be doing but you haven't been doing. Hallelujah, Jesus. I bring it to your throne. I confess it, Lord. I confess it to you, Lord. Wash me. Cleanse me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I take authority over the enemy. I take authority over depression. I take authority over addiction. I take authority over pornography addiction. I take authority over chemical addiction. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, let that person go. In Jesus' name, the Lord rebuke thee. In Jesus' name, we bind that which comes against the children of God. We take authority over that spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, lift up your voice, young people. This is the moment. This is the day the Lord has made. Yes, Jesus. Come on, let the word be the final response to this problem. I'm going to obey the word of God. I'm not going to explain this away. I'm not going to rationalize this sin. I'm not going to allow it to have a place in my spirit. In Jesus' name. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Hallelujah. I feel that there are some young people who realize the power of this moment. There are some young people in this house who realize the significance of this moment. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, we bind that spirit that comes against your child. Render it powerless, Lord. Send it to hell from whence it came, we pray. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, execute your righteous judgments against it. I'm going to trample this lion under my feet. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. He lobo satanaraba ye korobo setanaraba. 
Yes, come on, lift your voice to the Lord. There's victory coming. There's victory coming to this house. 